You ready with the streaming? Yep, we're live. Pardon me? We are live. Okay, great. All right, everyone, um, let's get started then. Welcome to the fourth class in the Observing Basics series. Tonight's subject is astrophotography and astroimaging. Uh, and in case you're wondering, these two terms are really synonymous. So whenever you hear astrophotography or astronomical photography or astronomical imaging or astroimaging, from our viewpoint, it's, it's all the same uh, subject, uh, which is basically taking photographs of the night sky and objects within the night sky. So for those of you who have joined us for previous classes, any of the first three classes, welcome back. For those who are joining for the first time tonight, welcome. Do be aware that all these prior sessions have been recorded and tonight's session is being recorded too. And these are available through our website uh, for you to uh, view, uh, if you wish, or re-review. Uh, the links are on our website. I believe also the, uh, the links are, have been entered into the chat uh, that you can use, or at least the link for the SFAA site. Um, as in previous classes, we're going to try to keep this to around an hour. This is a big subject, so we might run a little bit over. Um, I do ask that if you have questions as we go along, please do type them into the chat. Uh, Liz Triggs, who is a, a fellow SFAA, San Francisco Amateur Astronomers board member, has joined us tonight and she will be moderating the chat. Uh, and we'll try to get to all those questions after the presentation. Um, and maybe we can open it up for some live back and forth too, depending on how we're doing. But in the meantime, please do remain muted. Any, any type of background noise can be very distractive and distracting, I mean, and, and somewhat difficult to track down. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a, a, a very big subject. And so we'll necessarily have to take a high level view tonight. Our goal is to give you enough information, regardless of where you are in your journey, so that you can orient yourself and decide what your next steps are. We won't really be able to get too deeply into specifics. However, you should be aware that uh, the uh, San Francisco Amateur Astronomers have a Slack uh, account, a Slack platform, available to members through our website. That, that's where you would sign up. And this is an opportunity for people to have online discussions of, uh, of various topics. And one of the topics uh, under what we call a channel is astrophotography. So that's a place where you can ask all the questions you want. And uh, to members who may be able to help you, uh, questions about techniques, about equipment, uh, or you can just share your pictures. And even better news is that the SFAA uh, club is planning, uh, hopefully uh, as of March, that, that should be our launch date, to set up a separate astrophotography section. And this will be a, a section that uh, will meet um, hopefully periodically, probably initially via Zoom. And it's, it's, it would be a great opportunity for members to interact, ask, ask questions, and share knowledge about techniques and equipment and share their work. So keep an eye out for that. There, um, there'll be an announcement in our weekly, an announcement on the website, maybe a separate email announcement. Keep an eye out for um, that as well. So um, I'm joined tonight also by James Nelson, an SFA board member who has a lot of experience in astrophotography and is, is particularly, has particularly deep and specialized knowledge of, of astrophotography in the deep sky area. So I'm going to present part of the program, then I'm going to hand it off to James, who will, will handle the deep sky, and then the two of us will hang around afterwards for, uh, for questions. So let me then, uh, I'll start off, I'll share my uh, screen. Uh, Bear with me.
So here's, here's basically our agenda for tonight. We'll start out, I'll start out with an overview of some subjects, basic types of astrophotography and imaging, types of cameras and sensors, and some other basic concepts and issues. And then we're going to take each of the three different types of astrophotography separately. And so I'll lead off with nightscapes, uh, which are basically landscapes, but at night with the night sky. Uh, and I'll also handle bright planets and the moon. Yeah, I may, may refer to this as sort of solar system imaging, but because of time constraints uh, and because the bright planets and the moon seem to be the most popular, we're going to have to restrict the discussion tonight to just the bright planets and the moon. Later, when we establish the uh, uh, astrophotography section, we can go into other types of of solar system imaging, including of the sun, which is a specialized subject requiring special equipment, special techniques, and some safety concerns. And so that's something we, we could possibly deal with separately. So uh, some general comments first. Um, I strongly advise you to start right where you are now. Start with what you have, then build on that. In other words, I recommend you not go out and buy all the stuff you think you're going to need because you may not need it. And what you are really buying is complexity probably and you're setting yourself up to maybe be kind of overwhelmed. If you start with what you have, one of the advantages is you already have it. You don't have to order it. You don't have to go to a gazillion camera shops and go online and ask friends for advice. You can start tonight if you want or this weekend there's good weather. And what I mean by that is when I say start, go outside and start taking pictures at night when it's dark. You may know, you probably do if you already have it, know how to turn your camera on and how to use it in the daytime. You may have some knowledge of the nighttime, but really it's different at night. Everything's different. And I, the first time I went out with a DSLR, I couldn't get anything to work right. I couldn't even see the buttons on the camera. So get used to that. Start Start building your knowledge and your skills. When it's time for the next step, you'll know. And but take it one step at a time. And in that pro in connection with that, assess your interests, circumstances, and budget. Where are you now? What are your possible next steps? I just today, I just, or not today, but yesterday, I, I did this myself. I was getting ready to buy a new telescope or a refractor. And then I a little voice said, no, no, don't get ahead of yourself. And so I didn't, I just shelved it. I have other things to do right now, other equipment I'm learning about. And I'll come back to it when I'm ready. And that's what I recommend you do. And if you do it that way, then when you do buy equipment, you have a much better idea of what you need for your next steps. Money buys great stuff, fun toys, but it buys complexity. And some of these things are very complex and technical. So you need to learn the terminology, how to use your equipment and the techniques and uh, take your time. This isn't a race, take two years if you want to, but you're, it's going to take some time, I'll guarantee you that. It's, it's, you're, you're going to come up against all kinds of issues that you need to resolve, but keep it fun, please yourself and do it in a way where you get some wins. What's a win? A win is you take a picture and you like it. It's really cool. You're pleased that you've done this and now you're ready to try something else. You probably won't have any wins if you go out and buy a lot of equipment that you don't understand and you don't know how to use. You may never get beyond just taking it out of the box and getting frustrated and deciding to do something else in your spare time. Take lots of pictures. This is a trial and error <laughs> hobby. I could tell you what settings I use, but they wouldn't work for you. I mean, they might give you a start, but they wouldn't work for you because you probably have different equipment, different conditions. How do you find out what works? By trial and error, take lots of pictures. It's not like you're buying a lot of film. In the digital age, this is all relatively free. I mean, the imaging is, not the equipment. But do keep it fun. If you get to a point where you're not having fun, back up, why not? Where did you get off the path? What can you do? I've had to do that a couple of times. I have done every single thing on this list the wrong way, at least once. That's why I'm giving you the benefit of my experience. 
All right, so types of astrophotography. Nightscapes, a nature shot like a landscape, but uh, performed at, at or taken at night. And I don't mean sunsets and so forth. I mean a night shot, usually involving the, well, involving the night sky. Of course, the night sky will be there with some celestial objects. It might be only the night sky, or it more typically involves some terrestrial features, trees, mountains, buildings. Uh, and uh, uh, is, is a, an actually a pretty fun aspect of astrophotography that I'm personally enjoying quite a bit. Uh, the next category is solar system. Excuse me, as I mentioned, we're going to do just the bright planets and the moon tonight. But it also would include solar imaging, uh, anything in our solar system that you can actually image. Uh, uh, but uh, that's, that's what, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll just restrict this to these planets tonight and the moon. Deep sky. Okay, now we're talking about things beyond our solar system, galaxies, nebulae, uh, clusters, and that's, that's the part that James will handle. Equipment. Okay, so first fixed lens. You can't change the lens. Some of these cameras, like the point and shoot to the right, is, are adjustable. They have a built-in optical zoom, but, but you cannot detach the lens. Well, you could, but I would advise against it because you're running the camera. Um, as opposed to a DSLR where you can, you can exchange the lenses. So how do you use these for astrophotography? For nightscapes, you just set it up on a tripod, but if you want to image something else, you end up sooner or later using a telescope. And so you attach the uh, camera to the telescope with an adapter and you take a picture through the eyepiece of the telescope. Uh, and that's called afocal imaging, but you can do a lot. It's amazing how much you can do just with a cell phone. Everybody here, I think, has at least a cell phone with a camera. Some of you may have other cameras. Uh, the point and shoots are, can be very good too, but something that's adjustable, ideally something you can use in manual mode or at least semi-manual mode. DSLR mirrorless cameras, so DSLR and DSLM, uh, I'm going to refer to both of them collectively as DSLR. Uh, the mirrorless is the more recent iteration uh, and has been uh, a, a, quite a popular variation. But this, the feature of these cameras is that you can uh, change out the lens. You could take the lens off that, the can that you use for the camera and attach it to a telescope with an adapter and use the telescope as your lens. This is called prime focus. Uh, photography. Uh, the, the DSLR is hands down the most versatile camera. You can not only use it for regular photography, but you can use it for all of the types of imaging we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, with some exceptions in that it, it depends on what kind of a DSLR you have, what its specs are, etc. But potentially it can be used for anything and it is self-contained. Uh, the only thing you would need to do is attach it to a telescope. You can connect it to a computer if you want, but it, it, it has storage, it has power, and it can take pictures. The third category, dedicated astro imaging cameras, well, those need to be attached to a telescope. They don't have lenses. They must be used with a computer or computer-like device. Uh, to image. The two main categories are those that are optimized for solar system planetary and those that are optimized for deep sky. So for those of you with a photography background, these terms are familiar. I'm sure this is the, the exposure triangle, it's sometimes called. Aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. And they all, there. I'm going to just briefly review this, but also make it specific to astronomy or astrophotography. Uh, the problem with ast for, for the, the particular circumstance that astrophotographers face is it's dark, mostly dark. Mostly you're dealing with a dark sky. And uh, the, the, the images you want are of objects that are tiny, 
stars and even planets look like points of light. Um, and so when you're, when you're trying to photograph something against a mostly dark background and pull out this, or capture this, this small portion of the sky that's actually lighted, you need all the light you can get. So this is all about light gathering and capturing, much more so than daytime photography. So the first, the first category here, aperture, uh, refers to uh, the opening of, uh, of your lens, if you're using a, a lens that has an adjustable aperture. The wider that opening, the more light that comes in. And a lens that can really open up a lot, like uh, something that is, uh, and we, we refer to f-stop numbers, the lower, the bigger the opening. And for ast astronomy purposes, usually the lower it'll go, the better. That comes at a cost. These lenses cost more. But something that's in the one range, like 1.8 or something, with 1.8, or in the twos, that's, that's great. And that's, that's called a fast lens because it's fast. It lets the light in quickly. It gets the job done quickly. But if you have a fixed lens camera, you can't adjust the diameter of the opening, the diaphragm opening. Uh, if you, some point and shoot cameras, you can. Mine, you can, the one I use. Uh, if you're attaching your DSLR to telescope, sorry, that's your new lens, your telescope, you can't adjust that aperture and dedicated astronomy cameras, you can't adjust the, office, the aperture. So what do you do? Well, as it happens, there are also telescopes that are faster than other telescopes. So one option is just to use a fast telescope for certain kinds of imaging. It doesn't work with everything, it doesn't work with planets. But for deep sky, it can work very well. When I say fast, I mean a focal ratio of a four, a five into the F6 range. Um, and uh, this is at an advanced level. But people who stick with this hobby to an advanced level often will have more than one telescope for this very room. Shutter speed. Okay, the longer your shutter is open, the more light you can gather, right? Uh, but there's a problem. And that is the rotation of the night sky. It always appears to be moving in a circular fashion east to west. And the objects within the sky also appear to be rotating. So your image will quickly become blurred unless you keep your exposures relatively short. And when I say short, they're an eternity compared to what you would use during the day when you would just be a fraction of a second. But at night, you could get up to maybe five or six seconds, depending on your equipment, what you're trying to image. Nightscape maybe goes on as 15 or 30 seconds. That's it. So then you need a tracking mount uh, or an equatorial mount, something that moves with the sky and with the images in the sky, rotates with them. That's a, that's a good solution, except for nightscapes. I'll, I'll come back to that. ISO. This is a term that goes back to the days of film, when some film was more sensitive than other film. And it was very sensitive, it was good in low light because it was, yes, fast. It got the job done quickly, but at a cost, because it also meant that you were more susceptible to noise, to light pollution, and your image quality could be degraded. But basically, the higher the ISO, the, the better, the stronger your signal, the more or you can do with limited light. Uh, the trick here is to balance all three of these. If you can't adjust the aperture and you're stuck on the shutter speed, the ISO could be your last best friend. But remember, it comes at a cost too. So ideally, hopefully you can do some trade-offs. There's also rounds and equipment. Uh, equipment workarounds too, but it, it, it often comes back to this. Now, if you're saying, well, I have a cell phone, I can't adjust the aperture and, you know, it, it, I just take the picture. Well, actually these native apps, some of them, you can do more than that, or you can download an app, like Nightcap is what I used for my iPhone. Now you can adjust the ISO. You can adjust the shutter speed with Nightcap and some of these other uh, cameras, and I, as I indicated, I, I recommended you start with what you already have. Okay, if all you have is a cell phone, download an app and go out and start playing with the ISO and the shutter speed. See what it looks like at night. One more point, ISO is pertains to cameras. They all 
generally have an ISO metric uh, uh, if, if they're adjustable. But when we deal with dedicated astro imaging cameras, then 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 the term is more often gain. It's a, it's a different scale, but it's the same principle. Higher gain, more light. Lower gain, less light. Too much gain, too much ISO, crummy picture, or maybe nothing. So you've got to keep it, and you know, you've got to adjust it. You've got to work. Okay. Problems in astrophotography, field rotation I've alluded to. Sky looks like it's moving. Objects within the night sky look like they're moving. That creates blurring if your exposure is too long. Atmospheric turbulence, this is a big problem for the planets. This is turbulence in the air between you and whatever you're trying to image. And we call this the seeing conditions. A lot of turbulence, poor seeing. It's relatively still air, good seeing. With planets, they're small little disks that you have to magnify. And with atmospheric turbulence, they can look like they're wobbling, blurry, moving around sometimes in poor seeing conditions. It's like looking through boiling water. So how do you handle that? Stay tuned, I'll come back to it. Light pollution and noise, big deal in the Bay Area. Plenty of light pollution to go around and it can spoil your picture. These are stray photons that get into your picture and spoil contrast, spoil sharpness. Uh, and uh, there are some workarounds for this but it is a big issue. And also uh, another kind of noise from thermal radiation. Sensors get hot in cameras with prolonged use and that radiation, the thermal radiation can mimic light pollution and spoil your pictures in that way. Equipment workarounds and, and so forth, but this is also something to, to be aware of. And finally, this is a matrix. I can't spend a lot of time on it, but this is when I when I mentioned a self-assessment, these are the factors you could take into account. Where are you now? Are you a one? Are you a 10? There's no better or worse. You're not a better person if you can enter a 10 than if you enter a one. It's just where you are now. What are your circumstances? I'll just mention one of them, budget. Um, you can spend a ton of money really quickly on this hobby but you don't have to, actually. Um, here's an example. Uh, I got from my wife a hand-me-down Nikon D90. In its day, a professional level camera. It's kind of past its prime now, but it still works. You could buy a used one in good condition for 100 to 150. You don't have to go out and spend thousands of dollars for the best DSLR. There's a great book by, I think it's the author is Alan Hull. It's called budget astrophotography. And I recommend it, it's a little out of date, but he walks you through how you do this on a budget and it's a great book. Okay, let's go on to nightscapes. I'm running a little behind on my schedule. So let's, let's pick this up with nightscapes. Uh, what do you need? Okay, you need a camera. You can use a smartphone, you can use a point and shoot, you can use a DSLR mirrorless, you cannot use a dedicated astro uh, imaging camera because it doesn't have a lens and it needs a computer as well. You should have a tripod. You want to keep it steady even if it has image stabilization, uh, a tripod. Um, and maybe some minor things like an adapter to attach your smartphone to a tripod. Um, you uh, Techniques. You've got to keep the exposure short, 15 to 30 seconds. And, and you don't really have the alternative, at least at the basic level of using a tracking mount. Why? Because the stars are moving, but the foreground images are not. Your buildings, your hills, your mountains, your trees, they're not moving. And so if you move with the stars, you'll just blur the foreground images. Solution, take two images and put them together as a composite, separate images. That's at a more advanced level. We won't be able to get into that tonight. Wide angle lenses are not essential, but they come in handy because these are usually more panoramic type in images, just like a landscape is. Uh, you don't use a telescope. Telescopes are for magnifying. They're for zooming in on small objects. If anything, you want to zoom out. 
And so a telescope is not only not helpful, it's a hindrance. Composition and focus, well, this is the closest thing to traditional astronomy where you also have to consider composition and complex focus issues where you have to focus potentially on foreground images as well as on distant images. That's a challenge that you would find in regular landscape photography. You should also have a strategy for a, a remote release or use a self timer on your device. You don't want to press the button on your camera exploring because you're taking longer exposures. Um, okay, so let's let's walk through this. Let's start with the cell phone. Okay, what would we do to take a landscape nightscape issue with the cell phone? Well. Um, uh, Hold it up and take the picture or put it on a tripod. I took this without a tripod at the Mount Tam lot with my cell phone. I wanted to capture the crescent moon and Venus together. Three lessons. First, the sky is going to always look brighter with a cell phone because it uses algorithms. And sure, you can adjust it and do, do, do certain things so that it looks bluer, it looked a lot darker when I took this picture. And the moon and Venus looked a lot bigger too, because I was looking at them. But in this picture, you can barely see them. So consider your composition, consider what it will look like. This is part of the trial and error process. All that said, I don't think this was a mistake. I like this picture and it reminds me of that star photo and of the moon and Venus, which were close to each other for quite a while. So you might think of nightscapes as being kind of like your travel pictures that you take on a trip or at an event to remind yourself of what you did. Um, okay. So I went home and off my rear deck, I looked south, I'm in Marin County towards Mount Tamalpais. The moon had moved on, but there was Venus, but I wanted some stars. And I took a lot of shots trying to see stars and most of them, the more I darkened the sky, less I could see the stars. And as you can see here, Venus is a little overexposed. But anyway, it did take the night sky. I think I used nightcap for this, and I think I did use a tripod. I knew the Milky Way was right next to Venus. I hope to get the Milky Way, no dice. Not dark enough, not a dark enough, I think. So then I tried my point and shoot. What did I get? Uh, I, I don't know if you could really see this on Zoom, but if you the the, the, the regular image uh, is I'll use my pointer here. Uh, hopefully you can see this. That's a Milky Way. I did see it with my pointer, too. Um, and I was able to take it in a landscape mode too because I have a Zoom lens in the pointer. Too. Then I decided, okay, now I'll see if I can get the Milky Way with my DSLR. And I used a prime lens. I did not have a wide angle lens, just a standard millimeter prime lens. And oh, oh, problems. Yes, uh, first problem, not in focus. Okay, um, how did that happen? Well, it happens easily actually. So the technique is do your focusing before it gets dark when you can see things like, well, these, the Mount Tam in the background, focus on those trees on the top, dial it in. Some people actually tape the focus ring so it won't change. The other thing you can do, aim your camera at a bright star, use live view, crank it up a bit and focus on that bright star. If you to focus, it'll be bigger and bloated. And then when I turn the dial the other way, maybe get back to, to get it down to a, a point. Resolve it to the lowest point you can, the, the tightest point you can, and, and now it would be in focus. So it started raining and I wasn't able to follow up and finally I decided I'll try again, but the Milky Way was gone and Venus was gone <laughs> and the moon wasn't in the shot. And I used, what I didn't want to use, I used a zoom lens. There's more glass in a zoom lens and so your pictures will not necessarily come out as well with that glass. That's why I originally tried with the prime lens. So here's what I got. And it's not bad. Now you see the stars are in focus. As a bigger picture, it looks better. Could this be even better? Sure. I'm not sure the conditions were that great. There was possibly smoke in the air from the big surf fire. Um, maybe with a filter, it could have been better. With a prime lens, it could have been better. But the bottom line is you want 
you really want better, I mean, taking pictures in the Bay Area is fine, but you really need a dark knife for some of these pictures, and particularly for the Milky Way, you really want the stars to pop, a darker sun, like this. So this is a picture taken by P.J. Cabrera, our immediate past president of the SFA, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. But P.J. took this picture, I think, in the Point Reyes area. And uh, now you see the Milky Way. Now you see the stars. Nice dark sky, good technique. So that's, that's what you can do uh, and, and really what you should do if you want the Milky Way. Go to a dark side. Okay, so let's go on now to uh, planets and the moon. What kind of equipment? Any kind of equipment we've already discussed. You could use your cell phone, dedicated astro imaging camera, DSLR, mirrorless camera. For some of this, um, most of it, you need a telescope or a suitable telephoto lens and a mount uh, to hold it steady. For some of this, you really actually need a mount that is motorized. It will move with the image. It doesn't have to rotate with the image, but it needs to move with the image. So let's start out with the cell phone. Here's an adapter. This is called the Leven hook, or I hope I'm pronouncing it right, L-E-V-E-N-H-U-K, recommended, recommended by a friend. I've had good success with it. So on the left, you see the device and the sort of the jaws here uh, are what go around the lens. And then you put the phone on top uh, with the lenses down. If you have multiple lenses, like I do, I have three lenses, figure out which lens of those three you want to use and center that over the eyepiece, put it all together as in the image at the right, then put the eyepiece in a telescope. And if you have a planet uh, like Saturn in view, take a picture or take a bunch of pictures and select the best one. And you're trying to get lucky here. You're trying to find it when it's not really distorted with one of your shots. So uh, here's that. Okay, I mean, it looks like Saturn. It's not the greatest picture in the world, but that is definitely Saturn. I took that through my eyepiece with my cell phone. And I did use an eight inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, which is better for planetary because it has a long focal length compared to other telescopes. Uh, and again, this is a focal. I'm using it through the lens. So, um, and by the way, this, this, this kind of thing, this, you, you don't just use, have to use a telescope. You, telescope, you could hook your DSLR up uh, with an adapter to use the prime focus and then take a series of pictures perhaps and then choose the best. That's sort of a manual sorting through those images. There are ways to do this in an automated way, take a lot more pictures and then stack them. And that's something that, that James might get into more because that's very useful for uh, deep sky. Um, but um, what I found to be the most effective is to take a movie. And that's a technique for overcoming turbulence, the movie option, lucky imaging. You're trying to get lucky, but not just with a couple of shots, one or a couple of shots with a lot of shots. So you, you can do this with a cell phone. You can do it with a DSLR that will, will take a movie at this frame rate, 15 to 30 frames per second. But if, you're, if your cell phone will do this, if your DSLR do this, you can do this. With, with those cameras. I used a dedicated astro imaging camera that was not expensive, it was like $200. I did have to hook it up to a computer. Yeah, the, the, the movies are short for planets like Jupiter and Saturn, two to three minutes. Why? It's not because of field rotation, it's because those big planets are rotating so fast that if you go over two minutes, things will have changed. On Jupiter, the red spot will have moved. And that's something that's kind of hard to overcome with processing software. So keep it short. Depending on your frame speed, hopefully you can get 2,000 to 4,000 frames, somewhere in that range. And then you use software to get rid of all the bad frames, keep the good ones and stack them. You need a telescope. A motor drive would be preferable. 
the kind of imaging with a dedicated camera, I don't know how you would do that without a motor drive because the problem is the sensors in these cameras are really small. And trying to get the planet in view of that sensor and keep it there long enough to take the movie is tough. And if you're trying to move your telescope manually, I don't think it would be possible, uh, even if you're a you know, relative uh, camera Houdini. Other kinds of imaging, though, you could do with a, without a motor drive. Uh, 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 but this, this particular type, I think you would need at least that. Um, then you need your capture and processing software. So how does this look? Okay, we'll start with Saturn. I didn't do, this is kind of out of the word, but I wanted to keep the planets together. So I actually started with Jupiter, then went to Saturn, and then back to Jupiter. Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to initially show you the movie that I made. The first time I tried to image Saturn. Okay, so you see it, see it kind of moving around, it's tiny, it's moving around, it has no color, no detail, but you can see the rings and it's moving around. Most of that's probably air turbulence. That's what the effect is. That's why these images seem to bounce around a bit. Now, some of it could be vibration, it could be the tracking drive, it could be various things but most of it's probably just turgon. So I processed it. And through the processing, that little tiny featureless image became this. Whoops, playing the movie again, trying to get to the next slide. There it is. This is what I ended up with. A little fuzzy. I actually didn't hit my minimum of 2,000. I didn't, I, I hadn't figured that out yet. So this is probably 1,000. Uh, so it could be sharper, but you can see the bands, you can see detail, and you can see color. And you use software to bring that color. For a while, you don't see any color, and then, and then you do, and it's it's pretty amazing. Because let's, let's go to Jupiter. What is Jupiter? Okay, here's my Jupiter movie. Okay. Whoa, it's all over the place. I mean, I might have bumped the telescope for that one, but now now you see it just bouncing around, air turbulence. Could have been a little wind or something. You don't notice the vibration, but your telescope does because it's magnifying the images. Everything's exaggerated. So there, now look at that. It stopped, the movie stopped. Look at this image. You can see some bands, but there's no color and it's fuzzy and it's tiny. So I processed it and I this time I really didn't take enough frames. I think it was 500 or less. I, I really hadn't figured this out yet. And this is what I ended up with in the next frame. And there's some color. There's something I would call a, at least one band, but it's fuzzy, it's it's not sharp, there's no real. Uh, again, 3,000 frames this time. And here we go. So you can see you get a much better result when you do the whole process. I had to use a lot of software and a lot of steps. Um, this is all free software. You can buy software and that is more sophisticated, and but this is free. You could also combine it. I didn't use need to use both Auto Stackard and Registax, but I like Registax for the stretching. That's where you bring out the color uh, from something that looks like almost monochrome. The data is there. You got to bring it out. You have to stretch it using that software. Auto Stackard, you sort the frames. You analyze the frames, and based on the feedback you get, you decide how much are you going to use. You use 10%, 15%, and then you jettison the rest of them. What's left, you process, stack, denoise, do a lot of steps, and it gets better and better. You stretch it. You finish up with something where you can kind of polish it up. And I was very pleased with this. It's still not quite there. I don't like the kind of yellowish tinge. I couldn't get rid of it without affecting the other colors. So I'm, and again, I have a capture. I just couldn't complete it for tonight. But that's a great thing about astro imaging. There's always another day. There's always another try. It's kind of like playing bridge. Always another hand. Okay, almost finished. I think I'm now back on schedule. And I'll hand it over to James pretty quickly. The moon, piece of cake compared to this other stuff. You can use a cell phone. You can use your DSLR with a lens, it's some kind of telephoto lens, but not an extreme one. 
You can um, use a dedicated imaging camera. You can use the movie technique if you want something really sharp. You can take a series of pictures and, and choose the best one. You can take a whole lot of pictures and stack them. Lots of options. The moon's very bright. It's big, it's easy to find, and it's really accommodating because it keeps coming back every month. Jupiter and Saturn, no, they disappear for a while, then they come back. Mars, every two years, it's in opposition. So this is a great subject. If nothing else works, if you just wanna try something, try the moon. Best to do it when it's not a full moon, part of it's in shadow, uh, you get more detail. Uh, maybe with a nightscape full moon, but most people seem to do something like this, this image that Philip Rice took using, look for it, a cell phone. So do remember the cell phone is a very capable instrument. If that's all you have, you can take it a long way. There are articles on this. There's an article in Astronomy Magazine. There's lots on the web about it. So go to it, have fun. All right, over to James. And I'll stop my share so that James can now share. James, can you check your volume, please? Is that working for everyone? Perfect, thanks James. Okay, sorry, I had a hard time finding the slideshow. Okay, all right, thank you so much, Bill. I'm gonna elaborate on some of that stuff and talk about the deep sky portion of astrophotography. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover, so I'm gonna go over as many topics as I can. Some of them might be just brushed on, but if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to add them in the chat and I'll try to go over them at the end. Um, all right, let's get started. So what is deep sky astrophotography? What are some of the targets? So uh, we take pictures of nebulae, galaxies, star clusters, and globular clusters, which are for the most part, all uh, objects that are within our own galaxy in the Milky Way, with the exception of other galaxies. So nebulae are basically clouds of dust and different atoms that are all swirling around in space. And some of them are so hot that they emit light, like these two here. This is the California Nebula. And this is shot in narrowband, which I'll explain later. And both of these are shot in narrowband. And this is the Flaming Star and Tadpoles Nebula, because there's two little tadpoles and they're going for a swim. So um, these are uh, examples of nebulae. I have a picture of a galaxy later and star clusters and is a uh, familiar with those. So how do we do uh, deep sky astrophotography? Bill briefly touched on the idea of stacking, which is where we take many different um, exposures, you know, pictures that we might have taken for, you know, long exposures, and then we put them all together, stack them together. It uh, helps eliminate noise in each shot, shot noise, thermal um, shot noise, and uh, any sort of pattern noise that the sensor might have. And it stacks them all together and it strengthens the signal of your images to get things that look like this. Even though each shot, I have an example at the end of a, what a single shot would look like. All right, let's get started. So some of the equipment that you need, uh, you need a mount that's able to track. Uh, the common mount is an equatorial mount because it allows you to um, track the stars as they rotate and compensating for field rotation. Um, alt azimuth mounts, which are great for visual observation are a little bit limiting because of that field rotation. So there is a solution. You can use a wedge, which orients the uh, alt azimuth mount towards the polar, uh, the Northern celestial pole for us in the Northern hemisphere and allows you to track the stars as they move in the sky. Uh, the other thing is short exposures. And one of my first images was taken with 15 second exposures on an Altaz mount. 
And you can see that even with a DSLR, you can still do it even if you have an alt as mount, maybe for your visual scope or something. It can definitely still be done. Uh, the second thing you need is a telescope or a lens. Um, there's a ton of different kinds of telescopes. I'm going to get more in depth on each of these uh, categories in the next few slides. And then you need a camera. You need something to take a picture with. Bill did a great job covering um, phone cameras and you know how far they've come. I know that there uh, there's a night mode on Galaxy S21, and even the newer iPhones can take longer exposure photography, so maybe up to three seconds. And if you point that at the stars, that's definitely enough to see a lot more stars than your eye can. Um, the last thing you need is a computer or mini PC for capture and processing, either capture out in the field while you're doing stuff or so you can bring your data back in and process it on a computer. So here are a couple of pictures of some mounts. Um, as I was saying before, uh, mounts that track in altitude and azimuth can definitely still work. Here's an example of one on uh, Nexstar 8 SE. And um, so this is great for tracking the stars as they move this way and this way, altitude and azimuth. Um, but it doesn't compensate for field rotation when the objects, you know, if you think about the moon as it rises, it's in a, it rotates across the sky before it sets. And these mounts are unable to compensate for that. But an equatorial mount is able to compensate for that because if you can see, there is an axis right here that points directly towards the polar scope, or sorry, this is called the polar scope inside your, uh, inside your mount, and it points directly towards the northern celestial pole. So that when, if you can imagine these green bands are parts that rotate, this one that rotates here is called the right ascension, and that is uh, tracking the movement of the stars in the sky as they rotate around the pole. So if you imagine the axis that comes out of the scope here, and then the mount rotates around it, that's tracking exactly how the stars move in the sky. Declination is the one that rotates around here. And that's a great um, way to think about adjusting for polar alignment or finding an object in the sky. So if you had perfect polar alignment, your declination wouldn't move and all you would track in is RA, but perfect polar alignment is uh, very difficult and you're always gonna have some sort of reason to track in deck as well. Um, the third option, much more portable and really handy because you can fit a variety of um, options on top of it. You can fit a small refractor or you can fit a DSLR and a lens or you can fit a refractor with a DSLR on it. You could put a, I've attached a dedicated astro camera to a lens and shot with that. And it weighs only a few pounds. You can pack it up in a box about this big. Uh, so it also, you can imagine the polar scope right here, and that will point directly at the North Star or the Northern Celestial Pole. And then it will track through, this bar will rotate in RA. Unfortunately, there's no deck tracking, uh, declination tracking on a star tracker, but it, you know once you stack the images, they'll rotate. On um, you might just have to reframe with uh, declination every once in a while. So this is a great portable option um, as well. And it's basically like a mini equatorial mount. Um, so if you're not gonna use a star tracker, which is what these are commonly called, you could use a tripod and your tripod is gonna be limited by star trails, unless you're trying to shoot star trails, which can be kind of cool as you shoot them around the um, Northern Celestial Pole. Uh, there's something called the rule of 500. Some people will argue for 400 when you're taking nightscapes and depending on your sensor size, which I'll cover later. So assuming a full frame camera on a lens, if you take your focal length and divide by, uh, divide 500 or 400, whichever rule you find is better for your situation and divide that by your focal length, you'll get the number of seconds before you start to see star trails. So if you're out and you wanna take a lot of exposures of the Milky Way and then stack them all together, and you have a 135 millimeter lens, you'll know you can get about three second exposures before you start to see star trails. Maybe four, it depends. Um, so that's just a basic of some of the mounts that you can use. Uh, so these are the different kinds of telescopes. 
Uh, you guys might be familiar with telescopes from how to choose a telescope, but some are better for imaging and others are going to have uh, different kinds of imaging pros and cons for everything. So I'm going to go briefly over some of those. Refractors have a closed design. They're really compact. They uh, provide really crisp stars and have good color correction because of uh, glass. Uh, there's very little chromatic aberration when the more element or the more depending on the design of the telescope. So there's doublets, which have two uh, elements, three and Petzval. Um, each one of these helps correct and align the colors in the scope. So as we know, light bends at different um, wavelengths. And so you use different layers of glass to help correct on each color to line them up. So they all converge on one point on your sensor when you're in focus. So triplets are really standard for astrophotography. Doublets, you might see a little bit of chromatic aberration, which kind of look like a purple tint, or your stars might have fringing on one color, might be red on one side, blue on the other. Um, Petzval is a very good design uh, as well. And you'll see four triplets, quadruplets and stuff. And uh, those provide really crisp stars and a really clean picture. SCTs provide a lot of focal length. They're not as compact. Um, and they require very precise guiding because of all the focal length that you have to make sure that your tracking is spot on that target because if it moves even a little bit, you're going to get star trails in your image. They're usually a lot heavier, less portable. Uh, you have to cool them down in your environment. They do um, require being uh, cooled to ambient temperature, but they're good for DSLRs because you can hook them up and DSLRs have very large pixels. So um, really good for really up close uh, images of galaxies, small galaxies, and planets as well. Uh, reflectors and Newtonians, so this is what Dobsonians are, but same design basically, except without the Dobsonian base. It uses a mirror and an open design, and they can be made really fast. As Bill was talking about uh, F ratios, they can be made quite fast. Refractors can be right in the middle. You can have a fast-ish refractor, but Newtonians are generally made can be made pretty fast because you can add more aperture. Um, SCTs are generally pretty slow because of all the focal length. So if you imagine focal length divided by uh, diameter of the aperture, you're going to get with 2,800 millimeters of focal length, you're going to get a pretty slow scope. Good for planets. Uh, prime lenses are great for wide field. So if you want to hook a camera up and get a whole picture of Orion and Barnard's loop, and get all those nebulae in there and some dust and everything. Prime lenses are great because they're more forgiving about star shapes as there's a you know, huge field. They're really portable and there's adapters for all sorts of cameras. I've hooked up my dedicated cameras to prime lenses and um, I've also shot with DSLR on them. Uh, sometimes with the aperture, you have an aperture control and contr control the F ratio to depend on how much light you want to let in. Uh, the other option with regard to lenses is a zoom lens. So one um, caveat about zoom lenses is that there's more elements in order to let the let there be a, a changing focal length so that your optics are a little bit less crisp, but it provides you with multiple fields of field of view in one lens. It's a great option as well if you want to, you know, just kind of see what you can do. You want to Try to get in close on something. And if you already have a prime lens or a zoom lens, you're already, you already have some of this equipment and can start shooting soon. So sensors, this is a uh, pretty big topic. There's a lot to cover. Um, the main goal of a sensor is to gather light, gather photons of light. And um, Bill briefly talked about gain on dedicated cameras or ISO, which controls, it amplifies the amount of light that the sensor is able to pick up. So a sensor just gathers all light that hits it. And depending on the gain, you control how many electrons get, um, say there's one electron per digital unit that's picked up on the pixel. Um, that corresponds to a certain gain or ISO. At lower gain or ISO, or lower gain, uh, Bill already touched on that. So there's a couple different sizes of sensors. There's full frame sensors, and then you get down to APS-C, micro four thirds, and one inch sensors. 
Each one of these provides a crop factor on your image. So full frame are gonna capture a lot more light and a wider field of view. APS-C is gonna imagine shrinking down your um, field of view from a full frame and then eight, uh, micro four thirds and one inch. And so um, it's kind of a way to, if you have a really wide field of view scope and you want to get a longer effective focal length, you can crop use a crop sensor to help get in closer on a target. Um, there's two types of sensors, even though sensors themselves are all the same. There are mono cams, which are just as I described, they gather all the light that you throw at them. So if I point it out, it'll just let in all the light and it'll be in black and white and measures it based on intensity. Uh, and then the other option is one shot color uh, or OSC is the abbreviation. And these cameras have something called a Bayer matrix in front of them, DSLRs and some dedicated cameras can be in one shot color. And they help you get a color image without having to use multiple filters to uh, get different colors. So the way that it works is that it takes four pixels and basically uh, red, green, green, blue is a very standard orientation and uses those to and interpolates whichever isn't picked up on the sensor. So if that's a red pixel, it'll interpolate what the other ones are and it helps produce a color image in one shot instead of black and white. Uh, the downfall of these on DSLRs is that if I can figure out how to share a different screen, DSLRs have a different cut uh, filter and these cuts on the filters cut off some wavelengths of light. We know the visual spectrum goes four to 700 and so on. You have UV and IR on either end. Um, DSLRs have filters over their uh, sensors that cut off a lot of light right around the 650 mark. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of the gas in space is. It's right around 650. It doesn't mean that it doesn't capture it. It just means that it's a little bit less sensitive to it. And as you can see, here's, I'll just scroll through briefly, but you can kind of see this 656 is where hydrogen alpha is. And so it's a, a lot less uh, effective and the efficiency of the sensor goes down significantly on pretty much all DSLRs at about 650 nanometers wavelength. Um, there are ways around this, and that would be modifying, oh, sorry. Are you guys back on the PowerPoint? Okay, perfect. So there are ways around this. You can remove that filter, and that's called modifying your uh, dedicated AstroCam, or modifying your DSLR, and it'll act like a dedicated AstroCam, like a one-shot color except the Bayer matrix will always be in there. And you know, if you want a monocam, you'll get a monocam. Um, that process can be done by yourself. It's a little bit technical or you can send it off to people and they'll do it as well. Um, it does change your white balance if you do wanna shoot regular photography. So you'll need to go in and if you shoot raw, you'll have to edit it later to fix the white balance. But it's great if you have a camera lying around that you're not using and you want to modify it, uh, it'll change your DSLR sensitivity and let you pick up a lot more of those reds. Uh, I will say that even though modifying the camera is a great option, it's you can definitely still shoot without a modified camera. And I have some pictures in, the, uh, in a later slide to show you some great examples of it. Um, another reason you use sensors is for auto guiding. I think I'll just mention that Auto guiding is where you use another camera on a smaller scope to precisely track the stars and tell your mount where to move if there's any errors. It's a really necessary part for long exposure astrophotography, but um, that's a, a much farther step. You can definitely do so much without auto guiding anyway. So uh, another thing to cover that kind of goes hand in hand with sensors is filters. And there's two different kinds of targets out in space, broadly speaking. There's broadband targets, which let in a whole, the whole spectrum of light. And there's narrow band targets, which only let in really specific bands of, uh, or wavelengths of light, because that's all that we need to capture the targets. Emission nebulae, uh, some of those pictures that I showed earlier, those two from the first slide are uh, narrow band targets. And the three gases that we capture are hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen. And those targets are 
the, here on the visual spectrum, you can see the wavelengths. Here's hydrogen and sulfur. They're both in the reds. And oxygen is kind of a green blue. Um, the way that you would capture these is by putting a narrow band filter that only lets in oxygen. And you put that in front of a mono sensor and because mono captures all the light that it can, it will capture only the oxygen because of what the filter lets into the sensor. So this is a great way to isolate and get an oxygen image and then a hydrogen and a sulfur. And then in processing, you take them and combine them all together. Um, broadband, on the other hand, is uh, you, it takes in a lot more of the spectrum. And unfortunately, light pollution gets in the way there because there's a lot of light pollution all across the visual spectrum. Narrowband's really good at blocking out light pollution because some of the band passes are three to seven to 10 nanometers and does pretty well with blocking out light. I do most of my um, narrowband shots from the community area in my building and I'm able to get a pretty good signal. Broadband, on the other hand, light pollution uh, saturates your sensor because light pollution is a signal itself. And here, if you can see, this gray line is the example of an IDOS LPS filter. So a good uh, light pollution filter that I've used. And this is the part of the spectrum that the filter lets through. And the dips are where it does not let any light through. If you notice the peaks of LED bulbs, which are becoming more popular on streetlights and in cities and stuff. And the three big peaks for sodium lamps, which are old streetlights, the yellow ones are cut out. So the filter does not let in those. And this is a really great way to be able to shoot broadband targets in from a city. It'll help make sure that your, satur or that your sensor doesn't saturate super quickly with all the light pollution, but still letting in important parts of the broadband spectrum. Um, if you'd like to shoot narrowband with a one-shot color camera, even though there's a Bayer matrix, it will still pick up red and blue. It'll just be less intense and you'll need to make up for it with more uh, total time that you collect uh, images, total integration time is what we would call that. And you can use narrowband filters in front of it. And there are some narrowband filters that will let in hydrogen and oxygen, nothing else. So it's called a duo narrowband, narrowband filter, and they're great to put in front of a one-shot color camera. So where to start? This is a lot of information already, but you might even have some of these things that I've talked about, and there's a great that's a great place to start already. So my friend Kat is using one of these setups, and these are her four pictures, and they're so impressive. I'm so impressed every time she sends me something new. Um, this is the M81 and M82 galaxies, pair of galaxies in the northern uh, sky. This is the Horsehead Nebula and the Flame Nebula, and some reflection nebulas in here as well. The Pleiades with the reflection nebula around there, and Andromeda. And all of this was shot with um, number two uh, here. So I'll explain where you can start. If you have a DSLR and a lens, you can do untracked shots on a tripod right now. Uh, once we set up the astrophotography channel or more specific group, it'll be we can totally help with how you figure out settings and how to take the shots and things. But you know, just know that you can totally get started now on track shots on a tripod. You're gonna be limited to nightscapes and or very short exposures. And if you're at a dark site and you have a 135 millimeter lens, you could try for three second shots of Orion and stack those and you'll definitely get um, a nice wide field of Orion. Uh, the second option would be track shots on a star tracker. So you put your DSLR and a lens on a star tracker and then number three would be modified camera for either one or two. And that'll let in that hydrogen data. It'll just be stronger. I mean, there's already, as you can see, there's definitely hydrogen in here. It's this red, the flame has a bit of hydrogen and there's quite a bit all the way through this area. So even with an unmodified DSLR, you can pick up red. It's just gonna, you, know, you need more time and it's not gonna be as, the signal's not gonna be as strong. Still possible though. If you have a small refractor already and a DSLR, uh, you could use a star tracker with your DSLR. And there's just a simple adapter that you hook up to your refractor and put it on the tracker. So I brought out one of my things, which is that exact thing. I have a small refractor right here. Let me bring it a little bit closer. So if you guys can still see, this is a 
uh, 51 millimeter refractor and the star tracker. And it's really portable. I can pack it up super easily. And that's an option as well. You can hook up a DSLR to that or a dedicated astro cam. And then if you have a refractor and a DSLR, your next step would be go to like an equatorial mount with a DSLR and then modify your DSLR. And you can add astro cam uh, after all these as well. Or if you want to take on a challenge, you can try an astro cam. Um, let's see. So just kind of the last little part here. It's super fun to collect data. And then the question is, what do you do with it? And so uh, what, what kind of things do you need on the computer? How do you capture the data? Bill mentioned briefly that there's um, software to control your camera and capture images. So some of the things that you use before that are planning and framing software. An example of this is Stellarium. It's a really great free desktop software where you can see the whole night sky and you can enter your um, camera and telescope and you'll see exactly what it'll look like through your telescope. So it's a great way to see what targets will fit and what you should try to shoot that night. Uh, there are a lot of different softwares. If you do decide to get a rig that you need a um, software to control, rig meaning your mount and camera and everything. Uh, the other option would be an intervalometer, which controls your DSLR and sets up the amount of time that each exposure goes for how often you should take or how long in between them, how long you want to shoot for, how many uh, subs, how many individual frames you'd like to take and that, that you plug into your DSLR and it helps to, um, automate your shooting so you don't have to worry about pressing. Um, stacking software. So I did want to mention briefly some things you might need to control in your rig are um, the camera itself, if you use a dedicated astro cam, your mount and um, any other accessories you might have. One of the things that you need to power at some point with a dedicated cam, the, the main difference between a dedicated cam and a DSLR, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier, is that it uh, has cooling. And so it cools your sensor and lowers the thermal noise, which is really, uh, really helpful, especially because sensors can get so hot that they add more noise into your shot and we don't, we don't like noise. So uh, you can cool them and the, that's the huge perk of dedicated cameras. It cools them and makes your images look very clean even with uh, fewer frames. Uh, so the cooling is something you would have to control the, uh, the capture through the camera and the mount itself. And then if you end up adding an auto guider to control the mount, you need the camera to communicate with your computer which will communicate with the mount and make adjustments as necessary. So stacking, I really briefly mentioned that you take all of these images that don't look like much and put them all together. There's a free program on Windows called Deep Sky Stacker and DSS. And there's also Serial, PixInsight. People have done it in Photoshop, but Photoshop would be for post-processing. Uh, so these are great options and a lot of them are free. Uh, these first two are, are free, Registax and auto stacker as well. Uh, and they'll help you get an image. So I will mention briefly, and this will be definitely something that we cover if you guys decide to stick around for our later um, group that we put together is calibration frames. So each frame, the subs that you capture of the sky are called your lights. And that's just your data the data that you captured. Um, unfortunately, the sensors themselves have patterns of noise and hot pixels and things and dark current, which creeps in from the sensor itself, not independent of what it sees. And so you take darks, which are send the sensor completely in the dark, and you just measure what the sensor looks like at 15 seconds. And if you're taking 15 seconds lights, and then you subtract what the sensor looks like itself so that you get just your lights. And so this is part of the calibration process where you subtract darks and then you're gonna, another uh, calibration frame is called flats where you correct for optical um, abnormalities. If you have vignetting, which is where the corners of your image might uh, be darkened because of some, you know, either your filter or a lot of various different uh, 
a lot of different variables. Corrects for vignetting, corrects for any uh, abnormalities in your filter, if there's dust on your sensor, and you're gonna divide your lights by your flats and it'll help correct those things away. And you're gonna correct your flats with dark flats the same way you corrected your lights with darks. So again, just wanted to briefly touch on these things we Can definitely go more in depth or feel free to uh, ask anything in the chat. Um, this is part of the calibration process. And then you're gonna get one completely stacked image. And then you go ahead and you process it through Photoshop. You adjust, you try to reduce noise, change colors and things like that. Uh, so these are pictures that I took as well. This is the North American Nebula with the Cygnus wall and the Pelican Nebula right here. This was shot with a one-shot color camera and a duo narrow band, narrow band filter that I mentioned earlier, uh, dedicated. This is a, uh, this was a mono camera, but broadband, obviously. Um, broadband filters would be the luminance red, green, and blue. So similar to um, uh, narrow band, which lets in hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Broadband, the equivalent for mono would be red, green, and blue. And so this is the Whirlpool Galaxy uh, M51. This is, uh, yeah. Here's the Heart Nebula. This was also shot with a, a duo narrowband filter and a one shot color dedicated AstroCam. This is uh, done in a false color palette where you can change the colors. And obviously, when you're imaging in narrowband, you're not getting true colors because you're selecting such selective parts of the visual spectrum. But uh, broadband is generally said to be closer to true color, or you try to get closer to true color. Uh, I added one last photo just to kind of show what a single sub for this would look like. You might be pretty surprised, but this is what the North American and Pelican Nebula looked like with, I think this was a 90 second exposure. And I stacked, uh, I think eight hours worth of data for this image. And this was the final product, but this is, uh, next slide. yeah, uh, this is what it looks like when you start. So not a lot of signal, but when you stack them all together, you're able to get a much more defined image. So it's just a single sub. Anyway, I think that's all I have. Uh, please feel free to message me on Slack if you're part of the group and you have any questions about anything um, or feel free to add anything in the chat. Uh, Bill and I will try to answer any questions. I uh, hope we get to see you all when we start up the astrophotography section soon. Well, Bill and James, great job. Um, I This was so much information and I'm sure that there'll be a lot of questions. I wanted to ask one though, uh, Bill, you had uh, mentioned a book. Is it Getting Started Budget Astrophotography by Alan Hall? Yes. I just wanted to make a note of that and I just put that in chat for anyone who might be interested in your recommendation. Um, and then I, I've got one question already here in chat. So um, anybody that has questions, please feel free to enter them there and, and I'll uh, be happy to moderate them. Um, the question is, uh, what are your thoughts about the streaks caused by Starlink satellites and the impact on astroimaging? So uh, it seems like it's kind of inevitable that there's going to be a lot more Starlink satellites going up in the sky in the future. But um, fortunately, through the stacking process, when you have, um, you know, like I said, that image was eight hours worth of you know, two minute exposures or 90 seconds, I can't remember. And some of them are bound to have satellites. If you have a lot of subs, you can just throw out the ones with satellites, but actually in the stacking process, uh, there's rejection methods that look and they look for things that aren't there when, you know, they make sure they say, hey, this pixel always looks like this and this area always looks like this. And if something looks irregular there, then it just throws it out and it eliminates it from the the uh, the stack, the, the total compilation of your data. And so you'll get a full image and then you'll get a rejection map saying, hey, here was this satellite going across here. But the rejection, uh, it, the rejection algorithm is able to notice that that streak is not regular and not part of what you're trying to capture and just removes the streak only. There's no artifact or anything. Uh, so fortunately, the software that we have is pretty good about dealing with Starlink satellites uh, just really, and same thing with meteors or things that might show up in your images. So at least for astro imaging, there are definitely ways around that through uh, 
processing and rejection algorithms and stacking. Yeah, this, this really wouldn't be much of a problem for nightscapes or planetary. The planetary movies are really short and they're really zoomed in on the planets, very small portion of the sky. And the nightscapes are so short, uh, you could sort of see the satellites coming, I think, and maybe delay starting your, your picture until they pass. Do we have any other questions? Please feel free to enter them in chat or raise your hand and we can uh, we can address it that way. Bill and James, a question I have for you is between the long list of equipment and software applications that you've mentioned, it seems like uh, you must need to have some sort of a checklist so that you have all the right pieces so that you can get the kind of output that you guys have shown us here. So are there any, do you have any recommendations on where to go to, to get that actual list so that you don't, lose anything from, from trying to, to, uh, to, to get some results like you've uh, created? Well, my, my recommendation would be do wait until you get to the point where you need this stuff. I mean, for example, you're starting with your cell phone. That's the only camera you have. Okay, on your list would be an app like Nightcap or some something else. Research that, look online. I use Nightcap. I'm, I'm happy with it, but there are probably nine or 10 different apps that have their pluses and minuses. And, and so sort of take it one step at a time. What I did with the planetary imaging is I knew I needed capture software because I couldn't operate my camera otherwise. And I had two choices, fire capture or um, sharp cap. And I liked sharp cap a little better, but some people prefer fire capture, okay. So you start with that. And frankly, it takes quite a while just to get that working and get your camera working so you can actually see something. And then you got your next step. Okay, what are you going to do with that? Well, then I, I looked at the different stacking software uh, and played around with Registax and AutoStacker. Finally decided I liked AutoStacker a little better, but used Registrax later. And I just did it step-by-step, step, Liz. I kept trying, kept working on it. The, Terminology was unfamiliar to me. It took quite a while. And um, there's a lot of information on the internet uh, and not everybody agrees on what the best software is. There's, there's quite a divergence of opinion on this. But again, I, I would really, really encourage people to not get in over your head. Don't try to do too much too soon. It all takes time. The documentation is awful. You can go on the internet, but then you'll find people arguing over things on the internet. It just takes time to work through it. Now, with our astro imaging section, maybe we can help you with that. We can we can definitely help you. Anyway, James, any any ideas? Um, with regard to uh, software specifically. Well, just all... James, when you were going through the, the different things that, that you use for every step of the processing, uh, you know, to, to a newbie, uh, it's a little bit overwhelming. So I guess my real question was, you know, is there, is there a source that lets you know what you need so that, you know, you don't get stuck mid-processing and realize that you're, you know, you can't get to the end? Yeah. So I, a lot of it is trial and error. I will say that, you know, most of the time you go out and you're I just frequently this weekend, I was trying out new stuff and didn't get it to work the first night, tried to do it the second night, got it to work, figured it out, you know, so unfortunately it means losing a, a night of uh, shooting in our lovely, so infrequently clear San Francisco skies, but uh, trial and error. And then I just keep a list of the things that I need. I have uh, a notebook of all of my um, times that I go out to shoot and I have a checklist of all the things that I need to bring and the things that I need to set up and make sure I've done everything right. And um, I know that with a couple of my Astro friends, we have a, a running uh, joke of, you know, small things that we forget sometime that ruin an imaging session and so that no one else forgets. And we have it on a Google doc and, you know, oh, I forgot to bring this one wire and all of a sudden I couldn't shoot. So um, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, and definitely making lists and just, you know, starting off easy, like Bill said, you know, start off with DSLR and a lens and, you know, making sure it's, and then figuring out what comes next and what else once you figure that out and so on. Uh, with regard to Mac-based astro 
uh, control software. Uh, I noticed that was a question in there. Yes, yeah, so I was no, just that. Go ahead. Uh, Starry Sky Stacker and Serial are both capture programs for Mac. I can't speak to their um, uh, setup and everything, but I know two people that use each of those and they've managed to use it pretty well. Um, when it comes to processing, there's a lot more options for both. Uh, you know, Photoshop is common, and then Pix and Sight is for both um, Mac and Windows as well. So those two are worth looking at, I think, for um, for capture. And then processing, there's uh, plenty of options. Let's see. You see the next question, James? The question is from Jessica. Is there any one photo or composition that would be your ideal or top photo to capture? Mm, a dangerous question to ask, but um, I don't think there's one thing. I think every time I try to shoot a new target, I you know, kind of become in awe of that target as well. And so while I was shooting the flaming star and tadpoles and I was processing it, I was like, wow, this is incredible. This is my favorite one yet. And then I've been working on the rosette recently as, since it's come up and I'm like, wow, I can't believe how much I love the rosette and I forget about it again. Um, there's some really cool, uh, my favorite nebula to look at is the heart nebula. Um, I think one of my pictures in there was that it's got so much to it. And I love them a lot, 15 at the center and such, but it's kind of cool to, um, you know, whatever I end up shooting ends up being my favorite target for, for a while. <laughs> and then I you know go on and I find a new target and that one becomes my favorite for a while. Um, um, and then GS says for DSLR, I couldn't find a good one, tried a couple, they all had issues and ended up using parallels and backyardios. This works really well. Do you guys have any experience with those? Uh, Backyard EOS is, um, I, that was what I started on for um, capture. Uh, I did start with it on Windows. I'm not sure if there's a Mac version for it, but Backyard EOS is a, is a common way to start uh, capture software with a DSLR. You hook it up to your Canon only. I think they have a Nikon one too now, but Backyard EOS is great for um, DSLR. I think it's only on Windows though. Someone could correct me if it might be on Mac now, but great capture software for uh, DSLR specifically. And it has a live view and focus and stuff. So pretty much, and it has a sequencing. So pretty much everything you need for the capture part of the DSLR, mount control, different thing. I'm not familiar with parallels though, but Always cool to hear new things, look into them, maybe recommend them. Uh, Glenn Robinson asks, can you explain how multiple shots of the same image yield more detail when they're stacked? Sure, so um, basically we're capturing signal and signal is, um, the reason that we stack is for an increase in signal, dynamic range and primarily noise reduction. So um, noise reduction gets, out of, you see diminishing returns after about 64 subs, I think 62, 64 subs um, once you stack them. But by removing noise, because it'll notice similar to the satellites in rejection, it notices what's, what's noise and what's signal, and it gets rid of the things that aren't signal in the stacking software. And so your images look cleaner, they look crisper. And by um, averaging pixels, so pixels that might be... Um, you know, might have really weak because a cloud might have passed or something. We'll later get averaged with that pixel later and averaging the more sub you have, the more accurate your data gets. So uh, always, always integration time and it helps increase your signal to noise ratio. So the more signal you have with more stacking, less noise, cleaner your images are. Uh, SNR, signal to noise ratio is a big factor of what makes images look crisp. So stacking helps increase your uh, SNR and your dynamic range as well. Primarily for noise reduction though, I'd say. Helps clean up your images a lot. At the moment, that's all of the questions that we have in the chat box. Does anyone else have any questions for James and Bill? Ah, here's one. Glenn says, so even though it's the same shot, there are multiple differences that the eye cannot see. Yeah, so it's it's pretty cool because all of these long exposure shots, so say that you could think of it as, um, to simplify things, there might be a target that's really faint and dim, 
and it's only sending you know one photon every minute. So uh, you're not going to capture that if you're sending. You're only going to capture that one out of six times if you do 10 second shots, or you'll get it one one that one photon in that pixel if you um, capture one minute. So integration time, the um, total amount of time that you're capturing is always the most critical. But it's really cool because these long exposure shots let you see so many things that um, your eye can't. And the more images you have, the clearer your data gets. And it really tells, you know, here, this is signal and this is noise and helps clean up your images. Did, did that answer your question? Okay, perfect, perfect. James, how do you decide what your target is gonna be on any given night? Mm. Uh, depends on where I am. And um, I use the planning and framing software. So I kind of decide what rig I wanna use. If I wanna use a big scope, small scope, big camera, small camera. And with that, I set it up in Stellarium, that uh, S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M. Super fun to just play on there too and kind of look at what's going on. And I see what time, uh, what time I'm going to be out, say I'm going to get to the site, or if I'm even just going out in my common area at eight o'clock, I'll go and see what the sky looks like at eight o'clock and then frame something and kind of see what looks good. What's going to be up for a couple hours. If I'm going to be there for four hours, what's going to be the highest in the sky for four hours, or if there's something, you know, winter is great for nebulas and stuff. So uh, there's always so much to shoot over the winter. And then spring is great for galaxies and Milky Way. And summer has a lot of stuff too, a little bit of both. Um, but the planning and framing software is a big part. And while I'm home, there's a website called Telescopius, T-E-L-E-S-C-O-P-I-U-S. -E -E and that website kind of tells you what's going to be in the sky tonight, what's bright, what's dark, what's going to, when does it going to rise, when is it going to set? Helps you kind of see what's out and let you know. Uh, it's a really cool website. It'll tell you uh, what all the different, um, you can filter it by galaxies, clusters, nebulas, and then you just kind of see like, what do I feel like looking at today? So I started a rosette project because I was like, well, it wouldn't be winter if I didn't shoot rosette. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Exactly, Kat. It's so addicting. You scroll through it and same thing with Stellarium. I find myself just scrolling through, looking at the sky, looking at what's coming up and you know, I'm like, oh, there's a nebula here and there's something here. And, oh, wow, look at this. So that's kind of the process that I use. Not, not anything super uh, scientific. It's just like, oh, what do I feel like tonight? So I think that what's great about that is the flexibility of it. it you know, you're looking at it and it'll mold to your schedule, right? Yeah. So that's wonderful. There's always going to be, there's always something in the sky. So, you know, if I'm like, oh man, I got off work early today. So I'm going to get an earlier view of, you know, things that are, in a different part of the sky than if I were to get off late and end up uh, home at like 10 p.m. I set up at 10 and only get a couple hours, you know, so. I was just looking to see if anybody had raised their hand and I haven't seen any uh, anyone do that. So that, uh, no, here's another question. Glenn says, I'm set up outside. So if you had a great view of the Western sky and a four inch refractor with a DSLR, what would you recommend right now? Um, Western sky. So things are going to be setting. And generally, one thing that I didn't mention is uh, shooting below. So as we know, there's atmosphere, as Bill talked about, that limits our seeing and transparency. So things at the zenith directly above us are going to, we're looking through one atmosphere. And things down low on the horizon, anything, you know, five degrees, you're looking through 32 atmospheres, which is crazy amount of uh, distortion that you're going to see in your images. So you want to make sure that you're over 20 degrees and then um, 20 degrees, I think it's three atmospheres, which is what a lot of people consider their limit. Um, let's see, what would be in the Western sky right now? Bill, what comes to mind for you? Do you have anything? Northwestern Andromeda, but that's more North, I think. Um, and the other problem, of course, west is you gotta you gotta be later because you're going to get the glow of the sun going down. Yeah. Um, um, so like southwest, like Orion's going to be in the southwest pretty soon. Great target for a DSLR. Um, yeah. Oh, Kat just mentioned that. Yeah, Orion is probably 
I mean, I feel like if I looked outside, it would be like pretty south or southwest right now. Yes. Orion's great. And if you're not in a super light polluted area, or if you have a broadband target, a broadband light pollution filter, Pleiades is also uh, M45 is also in the West. You get a couple hours on that. Um, Orion or Horsehead are, are great. Um, thanks, Kat, for that suggestion. But if, if you have a little bit of a view south, Glenn, then um, a four inch refractor would do perfectly on either Orion or Horsehead, or even both if you have a full frame. APSC, you might be able to get both of them, but those are both great targets in the south, southwest right now. So I, I would just add, I from my home, I have a limited view. What I was showing you is nightscapes were mostly south to slightly southwest. And so what I do is, and I have a covered deck too, so I can't look up too much past the celestial equator, but I know what's coming and I just wait. I had to wait for quite a while for Orion because of a tree, but now it's finally here. And you just you just have to be patient. Sooner or later, a lot will come over to the West, but it, it just, you know, it just takes time. It's seasonal. Well, Bill, speaking of time, Michael asks a, a smart and practical question. When you do many hours of data gathering of an object, do you leave your scope and let the computer take over? I, I don't know uh, about, about you, but I don't just because of, I live in a, a, a building with multiple people. And when I go out in the community area, I um, I like to sit with my scope. It's, I, I don't, but I could. So in other places that, you know, if I'm visiting my mom for holidays, when I bring my stuff down, I, I just leave stuff in the backyard and the computer is able to, you know, as long as you have a a plug going into your computer, it'll run sequencing, it'll run everything you need, it'll track and set up everything. So I do leave it, um, just leave it out and let the computer take over. I do let the computer take over as well while I'm down there in the community area, but I do sit there with my stuff, so. Yeah. And also, of course, things happen at night, like dew and uh, maybe a change in the weather. Mm -hmm. Or if you're out in a field, oh my gosh, sprinklers. So do take all this into account. Yeah. A lot of people leave their scope set up if they're not worried about that, but they'll cover it to protect it from dew, from the elements uh, during the day from the sun. Yeah. They heat, heat up any dark surface. So a silvery or a white cover can, can help with that. Yeah. It's definitely possible to fully automate and it's pretty easy if you have a computer and if you can run a wire into your house you can do it all from inside and you know i have dew heaters on my scope that make sure that things don't do up and once you kind of get in a routine you figure out what you need to um make sure that things run smoothly through the night and if something doesn't then you add it to your little book about things to not do next time so right. All right. Are there any other questions? Again, uh, I'm on the Slack channel. I've been in the astrophotography section of the Discord a bit. Feel free to DM me, uh, personal message me on Slack as well if you have any questions. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting you guys when we get the section started up later. I think it's going to be very popular, James. So get ready. I'm looking forward to it. James and Bill, thanks so much. I think this was a really informative session. And I think that the uh, astrophotography group is going to be really popular. Ditto. And we're very excited about it. So hope as many of you as uh, are so inclined and can will join us and uh, continue the journey. This is a great hobby. And there's so much there. I mean, you really could keep going the rest of your life and never exhaust all the, the possibilities. Um, so it's, it's really hard to only talk for, for an hour. So <laughs> uh, particularly James could probably go on for hours on each one of these subjects. So, uh, and it but, would all be interesting, both of you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Okay. See you next time. Thanks. Bye guys. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Thanks.